Is there a possibility that the United States and Russia will sit down and start talking peace in Ukraine? We talk with the professors and Marianne, Professor Adnan Hussein, Professor Marianne Cummings, and Professor Jonathan Bick. And then I have some thoughts about Kellyanne Conway's divorce and CPAC. Stay with me. I'm going to... You're not keeping regular. I'm telling you. this. Uh, I've lost faith is what's happened. And it's because of technology. I've put all my hopes into technology and I've lost faith in the universe. It's time now for the professors and Marianne. And we'll get to them in a second. But Joe in Norway, you made Satan last week. I did indeed. And here's what I did. I took some some flour, some water, I made a a ball of dough, added baking powder, let it sit, and then I boiled it for an hour. Mm-hmm. And then I cut it up and fried it, heaven. And I kept thanking God for you. I didn't do it your way. I tried it mm-hmm. a different way, but I'm going to try it your way tonight. The, the homemade Satan is there is nothing better. It's a miracle that you could do that with flour, create pure protein. Have you ever tried boiling the the, the dough to get rid of all the carbs? Yeah, so I, I cook it in a stock. So, so first you make the dough ball, then you rinse out the starch and uh, bran, and then you, you cook it like you did in the, the boiling water. They, they, the, the recipe I saw was you don't have to rinse... If you boil it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's different techniques. There's in the oven, there's steaming, there's boiling. The, the benefit of cooking it in a, a soup stock is that it, it absorbs the flavor. Right. But I'm talking about making the actual gluten before mm-hmm. the, the, the prepping it so it's gluten. Yeah. You, you can boil the dough to make the gluten. Is that correct? No, you you mix the dough with water, develop the gluten as you would a loaf of bread for a loaf of bread, and then you wash the gluten in the water. Okay, running water, and then after that you cook it in. I said okay in stock. Okay, then I was. And you don't need baking powder. Okay, Hmm. all right. What are you making for us tonight, sir? Well, as you mentioned, I made uh, wheat gluten from scratch, seitan. The other week, so I made another batch this time. So we should have have it uh, lying around in the kitchen or in the refrigerator for a couple of days. So uh, we'll take this and make a kind of seitan bourguignon or some kind of uh, rich brown, hearty gluten plus starch meal. Here we've got uh, potatoes. I'll make some mashed potatoes with Dijon and cashew cream. Saute some snow peas and carrots, and oh, for the sauce for the uh, the mushroom and uh, seitan, we'll have a f- fermented black bean. This is a Korean style one. It's uh, less sweet than the Chinese, so it gives a deep, deep dark color, as you would from a veal or beef stock. And I've got some fresh pepper. It's nice and fruity. It's like my DNA. <laughs> All right. I'm concerned, David, uh, that uh, if Joe begins using these so beautifully arranged uh, ingredients, it will destroy the visual appeal of this symmetrical, you know, vision that we have in front of us. I mean, I can just drink in these ingredients, although I do have to say, I think the seitan does look rather satanic to me uh and maybe not so appetizing but i've never t- tried it so you've never tried satan no i have not oh my god no. the arrangement is just to appease the satanic lord <laughs> i will hopefully hopefully give a give a suitable presentation on the plate when it's finished and the the drawing of satan was beautiful oh where is last that? week Forgot. fantastic <laughs> Professor Adnan Hussein joins us. Let's talk about peace talks. Anthony Blinken ran into his counterpart, his Russian counterpart, 
and they had a surprise sit down and any hope that America is going to engage with Russia in peace talks over Ukraine and what is the Chinese government doing? They've offered up a, a 12 point plan for peace. That's right. Yes. Uh, well, apparently it was just a 10 minute, very brief, unscheduled uh, confab that neither one uh, wants to characterize as a negotiation. So there was some words traded, but it looks like it was more a matter of uh, reiterating positions that they each have expressed in other contexts. Um, I think what's more interesting about the G20 meeting as a start is just um, how insistent it appears uh, that the Western foreign ministers, who of course dominate the G20, they've expanded to the G7 to include some other countries, but you know they're the principal party. They still meet as a G7, even though supposedly this was a measure to try and be more inclusive. Uh, nonetheless, they have the G20, but they also have the G7 where they believe they make the real decisions. But what was interesting about it was that they were so insistent on making the Ukraine war the central part of the agenda because they had an opportunity to perhaps gang up on and you know uh, push the discourse so that Lavrov, the foreign minister of Russia, would have to hear these these points and perhaps try to respond. And I think that's ended up dominating the entire meeting. India was the host, and um, it has had a relatively neutral position in all of this. It continues to buy Russian oil, has not imposed, and natural gas has not imposed sanctions on Russia that um, the U.S. and NATO allies are demanding. And it was um, hoping that it could try and steer the agenda away from points of conflict, as it uh, sort of announced in the agenda from the start, start, and to find where are places that. There is agreement and where we can cooperate to try and address some of the key problems that the world is facing, you know, climate change, the downturn in the economy, uh, globally, inflation, uh, aspects of development and so on. Things that are on the agenda for the global south and for developing economies, major economies that are developing like India. And they were very frustrated by the fact that they could not get any productive discussions on this agenda that I think we would all agree is the real important short term, medium term, longer term kinds of questions and problems that we need to be dealing with. And everything got sidetracked and derailed into this polemic between Western kind of foreign ministers and um, Lavrov representing Russia. So that was, I think, missed opportunities to at least work on the agenda that concerns the entire globe for a brief period of time and not turn you know, one of these few meetings where they have opportunities to to work together into, you know, some kind of, of uh, you know, <clears throat> you know, uh, continuation of the polemical war uh, at the at the level of discourse that mirrors the actual war that is, you know, taking place in, in Ukraine. Um, China um, did put out a, a plan, I believe it was last week, uh, it's been a few days, at least about five days, I think. Uh, it was a 12-point plan, as you mentioned. China has been under some pressure uh, by the U.S. and also, I think, particularly European governments who have been interested in enhancing their trade with China, but are um, on the issue of Ukraine are solidly maintaining at least their governments, you know, the US position have been putting pressure on China to uh, be more clear about its position, whether they support, uh, you know, uh, Russia's position or not. And they've raised this whole question, which was first, I believe, announced by the U.S. administration that China is planning or contemplating. It's never made very clear and no evidence has been provided for for this Uh uh, on rearming or supplying uh, Russia with military equipment. And so in some ways, uh, perhaps to detract from uh, the plan itself, uh, you know, the real discussion uh, has been really about 
um, threats about how much of an escalation it would be and how dangerous it would be for China to begin um, supplying Russia with military weapons, which it has denied from the outset very vociferously that it intended to do or was planning on doing. We don't know what the discussions you know, are, but it has, of course, continued to trade with Russia, and it really requires for its economy uh, the natural resources uh, that Russia has, you know, in plentiful uh, quantities of, you know, rare earth metals, the energy resources, all these kinds of things that are very important that they then turn into, you know, manufactured commodities. But China is also equally dependent on Western markets to, you know, absorb all of its production. And so it's in this difficult position. And so I think you can see that very carefully uh, delineated in what its 12 points are. On the one hand, it recognizes sovereignty of, you know, uh, nations. And it is concerned, of course, that, you know, there might be attempts to try and separate Taiwan from, you know, China, despite the fact that it's recognized in the one China policy as part of, you know, one China. Uh, or there are also, there have been, um, you know, separatist movements. We know, of course, Xinjiang has had, you know, um, some uh, movements to try and break away or, you know, develop greater autonomy and so on. And of course, Tibet. So it is very concerned about maintaining the principle of sovereignty, which of course has been violated by Russia's invasion. So it can't, you know, it can't completely, you know, wash that away. It, 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 it's in the position of recognizing sovereignty is important, but it puts up against it the counterbalancing that we have to be serious about taking into account everybody's security interests as a major principle of peaceful and harmonious geopolitical relations. And so it's trying to follow this line. And it comes down, I think, ultimately on emphasizing that what China wants is prosperous a prosperous global economy that works peacefully um, and it sees U.S. sanctions and the West sanctions, particularly on Russia, but many other sanctions. Some are against China, others against Russia. You know, Guerrilla History has been doing a series on sanctions as war. The num list of countries is really very numerous. Um, and so as a result, it spent a lot of time in that statement uh, criticizing these unilateral attempts to derail, you know, that it's almost as if, you know, China is now a, a real uh, promoter of like global, you know, trade, you know, like this is sort of the British position of the 19th and early 20th century. Um, so I didn't see in it, um, I didn't see in it like very concrete suggestions about what could be negotiated on, but what it was was an articulation of principles and urgency of the need for serious peace negotiations that respects the positions of both sides. And of course, um, that is very important. I mean, what it says is that, you know, China is actually concerned, I think, that this war that even, you know, senior U.S. Uh, military officials uh, in the administration or at the, you know, the head of the Council of For on Foreign Relations, Richard Haas, all seem to admit, you know, is at a stalemate and is likely just to grind on and that there won't be decisive changes in the, you know, um, territorial and military conditions of this conflict, which begs the question, uh, you know, why not have negotiations then? If there's really nothing to be gained by continuing the war other than destruction of many more lives and more infrastructure in Ukraine, why not try and move to a peace settlement? Um, so I think that's the position that China is taking is that, you uh, Let's encourage talks. And the reaction has been so interesting, just as it was for the Turkish diplomacy, diplomatic overtures that made some progress. You know, some people may exaggerate and say that a deal was in hand or others may minimize. But overall, the Western press has minimized those negotiations as fruitless and not really achieving anything. And likewise, are saying the same thing about China, that it doesn't provide a real 
roadmap towards a genuine uh, peace deal as if anything China proposed in concrete terms at this point wouldn't have been criticized as betraying, you know, any compromise at this point is looked at as um, unacceptable. So I think China is right by saying, well, let's accept these principles and actually try and start working towards some dialogue to see what, you know, can be um, achieved. Uh, the interesting things about the reaction is that the West in a united front has been minimizing this, saying it's not really use, useful um, and not very helpful. And China is just trying to deflect because it's contemplating. It doesn't want to be caught in this position of being recognized as a you know, pure Russian ally. So it's pretending that it's got this uh, you know, kind of more moderate, neutral position. What's interesting is Ukrainian leader, you know, uh, President Zelensky actually said he was interested in some aspects of it. Right. Of course, he doesn't want to concede territory and so on. But I think what this shows is that China weighing in is significant. You know, Ukraine wants to, you know, Ukraine, uh, China was Ukraine's biggest trading partner, you know, before all of this happened. Um and so he proposed uh, having a meeting. There's been no, re you know, uh, response to that request. But I think that might not have been exactly what NATO and the West wanted him to say at that point. And I think there's been effort, you know, to sort of pull him back into. And this is what we've seen continuously is that. Right. You know, in, you know, with Turkey, he was participating that, you know, Ukrainians were participating in it and they had some positive things to say about how a deal might be possible. And he even said Zelensky said things like that early on that, well, there might be a, a deal to be had. Um, it's been the West that has been pushing constantly not to accept. And now, of course, we do have, you know, very right wing or ultra nationalist Ukrainians that want to maintain a pure, you know, every inch of territory has to come back and we would never consider any kind of land for peace sort of negotiation. But I don't get the sense that that's always recognized as in the best interest of Ukraine by some of Ukraine's leaders and that maybe they would like. So we'll see what what develops. But I thought it was a major new development. Um, um, you know, in, in if you're this, looking, I don't if you're looking at this from thirty six thousand feet up in the air, and you don't care who lives and who dies, and you're America, are you okay then with Putin getting bogged down in a quagmire? Is this what you want? And if you're China, looking at this from thirty six thousand feet up in the air, do you want Russia bogged down? in ukraine too well i've been reading some things that suggest that ironically you know i don't know if they mean really ironically but <laughs> that ironically china is the real victor here right um they're benefiting they're getting cheaper you know russian energy because of the blocking of certain markets so uh cheaper energy is going to china um, they're getting these, you know, Russia is really dependent on 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 China uh, in this circumstance and um, that this inevitably will lead to greater Chinese influence. I've seen some I saw a really interesting piece and it reminded me, you know, it's exactly what John Mearsheimer, who thinks that you got to pit Russia and China against one another would want to be communicated, which was this whole question of Siberia. You know, it was only in the 1850s that or 1862, I think, that there were agreements that established the current borders between China and Russia. And of course, they had disputes over some parts of this territory as well that, you know, split, you know when the so Sino-Soviet split happened, you know, in the 1960s, basically. Um, but they're suggesting that it's very sparsely populated on the Russian side of, I forget the name of the river, the Amu River. Uh, yeah, I think it's the Amu River, which is where the border is now. Very, you know, sparsely populated with huge, but huge, uh, you know, amounts of resources that China really wants and needs. Whereas on the Chinese side of the border, uh, you know, there's millions of people who live very close and that inexorably 
the power of China, the population of China poses a threat to Russian control over, you know, this vast Asian section, the, you know, part that's east of the Urals, where so many of the resources are, but so little of the population actually lives, uh, to try and kind of foment in some sense that there is a fundamental geopolitical rivalry that's there between Russia and China that is masked by some of this kind of nice rhetoric, but that ultimately China is interested in weakening Russia because that may enable it to have greater control. You know, there's already some intermarriages. There's already some kind of Chinese investment in Siberia. There's already some companies that are owned to, you know, basically you know, take back this, this, or, you know, kind of be the dominant power in even that part of, of, of Asia. So that's why some people are saying that maybe it does help um, China. But I think some of this is sort of fantastical. As long as the United States promotes this polarizing vision of the world where you're either with us or against us and doesn't care that the vast majority of the world's peoples want the war to end because they don't think it's useful or productive. Including and, France and Germany, right? Well, that's what's interesting is certainly that you've seen creeping up. You know, there was a very interesting study that just came out. I'm forgetting the exact name of the, um, you know, of the uh the Institute, but it was a, I think it was the European Council on Foreign Relations actually sponsored uh, some polling um, and study. And, you know, they determined that uh, there's a real, uh, you know, gap between the, the West and the rest. But what it also showed is that there's a gap between the rulers and the ruled. I mean, the populations even in Europe are inexorably turning towards frustration with the duration of the war, the economic sacrifices that are being imposed on them. Uh, and um, they don't seem that concerned by the, uh, by, or rather maybe the reason why this was, these, this study was conducted to look at public opinion Um you know, is is that they are that there are some elements of kind of the elite foreign policy crowd that is concerned that this is an unstable and untenable situation. And that's why, you know, there's been so much talk recently about how we need to, you know, you see the US, UK, they've suddenly started talking about this in elite opinion uh, circles uh, that we need better outreach to explain you know, the nature of the conflict and the principles involved, because, of course, the global south doesn't understand, you know, what democracy and, you know, sovereignty and all of this, but that they're on the wrong side of history and they really need to be persuaded and that maybe we haven't done a good job of making our case. When in reality, what they're missing is that most of the world agrees with uh, China that we'd like to be neutral. We don't want to be pressed into um, a a uh, kind of alliance that uh, precludes other trade and political relations with other countries that we want a multipolar world. That's mm -hmm. what the vast majority of the rest of the world's population sees and that they see that part of one, one uh, motivation they see in um, the Western position is an attempt to reestablish and reimpose, you know, Western hegemony on the rest of the world. And they, they don't think, that it's they see that it's hypocritical. They don't think it's actually principled and they see it as an, a gambit to try and extend U.S. and NATO um, authority in the world as a declining hegemon. Um, so I think it's a very interesting moment. It was a very interesting and revealing study. Right. Right. Excellent. Thank you. Let us now turn to Illinois. We mm -hmm. well, the mayor of Chicago, Mayor Lightfoot. Yes, will no longer be mayor and as of the beginning first week of May, because she didn't place in the top two out of, I think, about 10 people running. And I re she replaced Rahm Emanuel. Right. So compared to Rahm Emanuel, she's a saint. But <laughs> no. So, so no. <laughs> we. She uh, was uh, toward the end of her uh, first and apparently only term. I mean, she was uh, referred to as ROM 2.0. Really? Yeah. Well, um, 
tell me what, what, what was the brand? What was I sold? And what did she end up being? She branded herself a progressive like everybody did. Okay. Right. So, um, okay. Let me uh, go back four years ago. The person who people thought would be the next mayor was Bill Daly, Rich's, Richard's brother, the one who was, uh, I think, Commerce Secretary mm-hmm. under Bill Clinton. And he and a lot of his Democratic Party minions encouraged a lot of what they thought were progressive types to jump in to the election because their biggest threat came from, was it uh, Tory Pretwinkle, who I believe is still the uh, the president of the Cook County Board, which is the county seat, you know, that includes Chicago. And uh, Pretwinkle was very much a Bernie person. And uh, so they encouraged all these people to jump in and that, of course, you know, uh, Bill Daly would you know, get enough to be at least, <clears throat> least into the uh, general election, if not just win 50 percent outright. I think he came in fourth or fifth. And the two the two top vote getters in the election four years ago, the runoff election or the uh, uh, primary election was uh, Lori Lightfoot and Pretwinkle. So they were two black ladies who were both nominally progressive. Um, in fact, uh, our friends, uh, Hardlands Media, uh, Kit Cabela, had interviewed uh, Lori Lightfoot, and she just sounded like a Bernie person. And the instant she got power, she just went back to form, which a lot of people warned against. Now, why wasn't Pretwinkle, uh, why didn't she prevail? It, Just so happened that um, right as that campaign was uh, gearing up, uh, her mentor in the city council, Edmund Burke, was hit with a whole bunch of indictments. Like happens like every other year, you know, some Chicago alderman ever since I showed up to Fermilab as an undergraduate, some Chicago alderman always get nailed by the feds for corruption. And so. Edmund Burke got hit with corruption charges and Pretwinkle could never quite shake that, even though she had nothing to do. I mean, she was, you know, she had worked for him when she was very young, a better mentor, but she definitely struck a very independent path from her mentor. But, you know, it makes you kind of wonder. But anyway, uh, so Lori Lightfoot prevailed in the in the general election and she prevailed by a lot. I mean, she won decisively. And she took that and uh, proceeded to, you know, do everything Rom was doing. Yeah, just basically um, pushing with the school closures and public building closures, uh, pumping up the police, going to war with the teachers union. And she even went to war, even though as she was giving them more money, she even managed because of her style to piss off the police department. And of course, there were, uh, I can't remember the young uh, boy's name, but a 13 year old just got shot and killed by Chicago police. Um, I mean, there's always something like that going on. Of mm-hmm. course, they are in poor, poor person of color, you know. So, so she, uh, you know, so her career has ended. Now, um, the guy that uh, is, okay, so Paul Vallis has been, he came in first with 34% of the vote. And he's kind of the right winger in the crowd. Uh, he's basically big time proponent for for uh, school privatization and charter schools, very much like his predecessor. Um, in the school board was um, became Obama's secretary of education. And I keep blanking out of his name. Arnie uh, he, Duncan. Huh? Arnie Duncan. On oh, Arnie Duncan, of course. Yes. I mean, and they're very big on on charter schools and it's basically taking private school money and and making these schools that are in principle open to everybody. But in fact, mostly are benefit like the upscale people, people who can get their kids, you know, who whose kids can be prepared for them. And they drain dollars from the poor neighborhoods and they've. I mean, Rahm Emanuel oversaw the closing of like 50 public schools. And of course, when you close 
public schools, when you defund uh, youth programs, you get a rise in crime and violence. And that's it's just this cycle. So um, Brandon Johnson, um, he has the support of the school board. He himself, you know, was, I believe, a teacher and he uh, was a very early advocate of Bernie Sanders. However, he ended up endorsing Elizabeth Warren this last round. People I know on his campaign said he's evolved since then. Okay. Um, so he's might have an uphill battle too. Uh, there, there is a couple schools of thoughts. They thought everybody that voted was going to vote for Paul Vallis voted for him in this election. He's not, you know, apart, apart from very upscale, rich money people, he's not really all that popular. Um, Brandon has got a reputation of being a coalition builder and that people tend to like him. Like he respects people. He can reach out. And he's, as I said, he's got the he's got the support of the Chicago Teachers Union, which is a very powerful union uh, and, and the nurses. And um, I think that if he runs a ground campaign. If he just gets into the neighborhoods and turns out votes where most politicians don't even bother, I think he can prevail. Hmm. But it was an interesting it was an interesting night. Who came in fourth was Chewy Garcia, who congressman. Uh, yeah, was congressman. I think he left. I think he's left Congress or is leaving Congress. But he's uh, he was a Bernie, a very prominent Bernie Sanders delegate in 2016. And I believe he still was. As a matter of fact, there were several city councilmen that were also Bernie delegates. We've got a very diverse city council. We've got like about five or six that identify as democratic socialists. So, um, you know, this could be a very interesting race. And uh, I've been following Kit Cabela's uh, coverage of this. He's just a little he thinks the problem is for a lot of people and activists is that is that they've heard this story before. Somebody comes out and he looks really great and he was for Bernie or at least for all of Bernie's uh, policies and they get to be mayor and, you know, they just revert back to form. So I said, well, I'm sure the pressures are there, but that is incumbent upon you know, the activists to, you know, you can't treat your guy with kid gloves once you worked your heart out to get him in. You right. got to be pummeling him. I mean, figuratively speaking, but you mean as hard as the forces that be that try to prevail upon anybody who's mayor, you have to counteract those forces. So uh, anyway. So the time table, there. give us the timetable. So uh, April 4th is the consolidated elections. I'm actually on two campaigns for John Lash is running. He ran two years ago for mayor, lost when all the Democrats backed the Republican. Right. <laughs> and but but Alderman at large can have a lot of clout, especially if you're willing to counter the prevailing forces. And uh, he's up against two other people. There's two Alderman at large. They run every other year. So these are four year terms and they're staggered. So half the city council runs every two years at, in, in Aurora. So there is also um, uh, my friend David, David Cannon, who is running for the fourth, uh, fifth ward alderman in, in Aurora. And what is motivating a lot of people to get involved is just this enormous giveaway. The Aurora City Council just unanimously voted for to give a multi-billion dollar casino company $50 million of taxpayers' money, plus $10 million of free land, and they say they'll pay it back, but under a TIF, uh, regular, which is basically, these are, TIFs were, I can't remember exactly what the, the words stand for, the letters stand for, but they're tax incremental districts that, they, it, it gives a tax break to uh, companies who wouldn't move into areas because they're dangerous or they're, you know, very low, low income. Um, we've had used TIFs successfully in Aurora where it made sense. But this you don't want casinos. in. Like, the but this casino, the land they're getting is right off the interstate. I mean, this is primo. And I, I was arguing publicly you know, that uh, in the city council meetings that, look, you know, we're giving 
50 million dollars of taxpayer money to a company for a move advantageous to the company because they're all losing money now. It's losing money in its location in downtown Aurora. It was making lots of money 25 years ago when there was only two casinos in the state. But now there's a lot of competition. And the only way casinos can survive is if they become like big complexes with hotels, with uh, you know, with conference facilities, recreation, spas, you know, things like that. So that's what they're intending to do. It's sickening. It was sickening to me that every single one of these guys voted for it. They had the gall to approach me at my favorite little jazz place here. All after three or four drinks, they uh-huh. have the courage to to confront me like, Marianne, you just don't understand. Tips are just normal part of business. I go, yeah, I do completely understand. They're a normal part of business. It's like, this is like disgusting, all of you. And it was really, I mean, when people were trying to, after these meetings, were trying to like, you know, talk to their council person before, you know, the final vote. I mean, they were literally running away. They were literally running away from them. And uh, I mean, I'm so disgusted. I may be running for city council in two years, even though this is a heavily really? Hispanic area. And uh, by the way, uh, Adnan, you had your hand up. I uh, Well, I, I was about to say, isn't this is parks versus casinos and isn't alderman or uh, city council natural a natural progression for a parks commissioner? Well, I wouldn't so, want I mean, it to be. But, um, you know, I'm since I'm already getting in trouble and getting some crap from people, you know, I might as well do it in a more public forum. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so but the, the big problem I have is that um, this is a heavily Spanish speaking district. And that was the reason right up front that I would never consider running. I'm not I'm not fluent in Spanish. Um, However, now I don't see it as an issue. I said, look, you know, I can tell you it in Spanish or I can BS people in Spanish or English or any language or, you know, I can just do the right thing. And, you know, all the kids have their little iPhones with the automatic universal Star Trek translator now. So. I think you can say hasta la vista to those corporate hasta interests. <laughs> uh, I think you can manage that. No problema. And people said, oh, you got the case right. You got the gender right. Ah, gracias. Yeah. Now, you didn't reveal these uh, exciting plans uh, when we were chatting at the Detroit Institute no, for I, Art uh, last uh, weekend. That yes. was very interesting. Um, but it was far more interesting listening to you go on about, you know, the background of all these Islamic artifacts we were looking at. So. Oh, I, I can go on on that any time. Uh, but I've been trying to get um, Marianne, at least it, it, through a kind of petition in the chat to run for Congress. But perhaps, uh, you know, she's it got would have to do it on metro- Metropolitan. I would have to do it as an independent. And boy, that's a hard nut to crack in the state of Illinois. Why can't you run in for Congress in Aurora? Who's your congressperson? Well, right now it's uh, Lauren Underwood. It was old. It was my old buddy, Bill Foster. And boy, they've got a ton of money. I mean, it took a lot to get Rachel Ventura elected to state Senate when the Democratic Party spent almost a million dollars propping up her opponent in the primary, I mean, on a state Senate seat. But and she, you know, was saying that I say, well, so what are you having to do with this party? Anything at all? And she says, well, you know, I have to get in. And, you know, she's already shown herself. She's already uh, defeated an incumbent when she was running for Will County Board. And she's already proved that she's willing to take on the Democratic establishment so she said that, uh, yeah, if I if I had ran as an independent, I'd get like maybe five percent of the vote. You know, that's that is a problem. It's uh, we don't third parties. I, I don't know. There's just the, the the Green Party has just blown it. And I know he's your friend and and you admire him. But damn, you know what? What did Ralph Nader do to build up the Green Party? I mean, you know, he you spend all this money on a high profile presidential race, but you don't spend the off years at least having a 10 year plan to get 
maybe five Congress people, you know, uh, it, 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 but it's hard. I mean, it's overwhelmingly hard. And the that's why I tell people, just like when the right wingers felt defeated, you know, in the late 70s, in terms of all of their, you know, their social agenda, they started running for school board, running for library boards. They were running locally. They weren't looking, you know, they 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 weren't putting all their eggs in just one election. They, in fact, even to this day, they don't even care about individual elections. I mean, Dr. Oz could have probably won. He'd be senator now if he just ran on his his persona. But he decided he had to like, you know, take on the whole, you know, crazy train in terms of policy. And but what that did was have Fetterman abandon almost all of his Bernie positions and go after him. And OK, so Fetterman is now, well, in the hospital. Yeah, we wish <laughs> but then what I'm saying is that these people, you have to care less and less about party. You have to kill it, care more about policy and have some long term strategy. If you get it, that's the best thing I think Bernie did was get tens of thousands to be, of people to run for public office on a low level. I mean, I didn't think the experiment worked with the Justice Democrats, but that might be too high. I mean, you have to start, you know, just very locally. All right. Great. Let's talk about non-compete clauses. Speaking of competition, Professor Jonathan Bick. Yes. Well, um, there are many ways that the U.S. uh, hobbles the power of workers and depresses wages in this country and uh, non-compete contracts is one of them. Uh, A non-compete agreement bars the worker from taking a similar job with another company for a period of time. Uh, And uh, you might think that these agreements, you know, would be used only for workers with proprietary information uh, from being hired by a firm's competitors. Uh, But a study from two years ago found that at least 38 percent of workers have had to sign a non-compete agreement at some point. The FTC, that is the Federal Trade Commission, proposed a rule in January to ban employers from forcing workers to sign non-compete agreements. So this is a proposed rule. I I recommend that people uh, contact the FTC, contact uh, President Biden, contact their members of Congress and tell them uh, that these things should be banned. Uh, If enacted, the national ban would boost worker earnings by an estimated 300 billion per year across the economy. Studies show that non-compete agreements depress wages in large part by suppressing wage competition. Employers don't have to worry that their employees will leave for a better paying competitor because they have this non-compete agreement on them, you know, shackling them essentially. Non-compete agreements were originally created to protect trade secrets in other confidential information. While they remain prevalent for well-paid and highly educated workers, these agreements are increasingly common in underpaid industries, regardless of job duties or access to confidential information. Currently, almost a third of non-competes cover workers who make below $13 an hour. Uh, so these things are difficult to challenge. Uh, you know, I, I've heard this thing where some people claim, oh, uh, you know, courts are, don't usually uphold these things. Well, I don't know that that's true. It depends on the judge you get. It depends what state you're in. It depends how they interpret, uh, the law and they see the whole picture. Uh, they are difficult to challenge. Uh, unless they are clearly unconscionable. But even where they are clearly inappropriate, most underpaid workers do not have the time, money, or access to counsel to challenge them. I mean, think about the reality of when these non-competes come into effect. Well, they're when you lose your job, Mm -hmm. right? When you're going somewhere else to (laughs) another job. So uh, if you're not allowed to go to that other job, you have no income. And so you've got to hire a lawyer, which are expensive, uh, take the case to court and uh, wait 
because there's usually you know a lengthy process. Uh, so working people just don't have those things at their disposal, the money right. and time. Um, the other thing that they do is they restrict job mobility. So when you sign a non-compete, it makes it difficult for workers to uh, leave their current job for better, higher paying jobs. Changing a job is one of the most common ways that workers receive higher pay, um, especially early in one's career. It's correlated with stronger lifetime earnings. And particularly today, when uh, businesses are not giving raises that are even keeping pace with inflation, never mind, you know, getting a little bit more because you're better at your job, you're more experienced, uh, you should be getting an increase in your pay over and above inflation. But most raises don't even keep up with inflation. Uh, so the only way you can get a decent raise these days is to leave your job and go to another one. But these non-compete contracts prevent that. So uh, this has an overall effect on constraining wages, reducing overall wages in the economy. With limited employers to compete for, workers have less of an opportunity to bargain for a higher wage and demand a better workplace. And these also disproportionately affect women and people of color. Banning non-competes would help alleviate some racial and gender wage gaps because the underpaid workers who are most affected are disproportionately women and people of color. Some reasons why non-competes can have a stronger impact on women and people of color are because they decrease entrepreneurship, they reduce outside work due to limited ability and willingness to commute, produce fewer wage gains, and provide firms more power to discriminate. Studies have shown that women are also less willing to violate the terms of non-competes. Women in states with stricter non-compete enforcement are less likely than men to leave their jobs or start rival companies if they are subject to non-compete contracts. Women and workers of color are also less likely to negotiate than their white counterparts, counterparts uh, which may result in more restrictive agreements for them. The earnings of women and workers of color are reduced by twice as much as white male workers when there is stricter non-compete enforcement. So the question then comes up, well, are these really necessary uh, to protect business interests? Are they legitimate uh, in, in doing that? And uh, the short answer is no, they are not needed for that purpose uh, because uh, there are many other mechanisms in place to protect employers against uh, breaches of confidentiality. For example, federal laws such as the Uniform Trade Secrets Act and the Economic Espionage Act protect companies from unauthorized usage or misappropriation of protected trade secrets. There are also state regulations governing similar issues and workers are bound by state common law fiduciary duties. These statutory and common law protections of company information can fill any void that employers may fear uh, come with banning non-competes. So there's really no reason for these other than to put yet another uh, shackle on, on workers and their ability to get a def decent wage and to ask for improved conditions in the workplace. Um, <laughs> So currently, there is no federal ban on non-compete agreements. Uh, but in 2021, President Biden issued executive order on promoting competition in the American economy that encourages the Federal Trade Commission to ban or limit the use of non-competes. So he didn't say you should do this. He just said it would be nice if you did this. Well, he did bring it up in the State of the Union, didn't he? I believe he did. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I mean, you know, so what we need to do is push the FTC to uh, institute a complete ban on these non-compete contracts. Uh, there is also a growing movement to ban non-compete contracts at the state level. Uh, state laws that ban non-competes generally fall into one of three categories. The first is 
laws to eliminate non-competes for everyone, which I think is the right approach. Uh, the other category is laws to eliminate non-competes for some based on occupation or income level. Not sure why income level should decide anything uh, in, in regard to non-completes. It would depend on the nature of the job, I would think, more than an income level. Uh, or three, laws to codify stricter requirements for enforcing uh, non-complete non-compete contracts. So some states that have passed uh, more progressive bans on non-competes include California, Connecticut, Illinois, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Oregon, and Washington. However, even in states that have non-compete bans, some workers are still required to sign them. So in other words, in some of these states, uh, they won't be enforced, but not every worker is going to know that. So when you have them sign it, they think they are legally under that contract. Uh, you know, if you're not going to enforce these things, why do you allow them to exist in the first place? Right. Makes no sense. Uh, in California, for example, non-competes have been unenforceable for over 100 years. But research, research showed that 19 percent of workers had signed unenforceable non-competes. In 2017, the California Labor Code was amended to prohibit non-competes that use a choice of law provision to get around the state prohibition. So, yeah, these things are uh, totally unnecessary. They serve no useful purpose for businesses other than to uh, push down on uh, wages, which is harmful to uh, employees. And, uh, you know. Most people in America are employees. They are not business owners. So this this affects most people who have to earn a living. So please contact the FTC, contact your members of Congress, write to President Biden and encourage that he institute a ban on non-compete contracts. Great. Before we go to Joe in Norway, you I, I saw your Facebook. Po oh, uh, Professor Marianne, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, just a quick question. You know, I just uh, Lena Khan is the chair of the FTC, and this is, you know, more than one time she's had good positions. What's really stopping her from implementing them? I mean, what's stopping the Biden administration? What's the hurdle? Is it just that Joe Biden has to sign off on it? Well, isn't there it's a they have Republicans. I think one of the Republicans just quit the commission. OK. Um, That's an excuse they could use, the Democrats. But I mean, it, it's like, what is the point of, you know, appointing a person like Lena Khan, who is I, I do like her, if like nothing she is advocating ever seems to get implemented? Is it just that they're letting it sit there? Is it could, could Biden move on this tomorrow? Um. Uh, I would uh, I would think he could compel the FTC to do so, but um, I'm but not. then it gets challenged. I, I, I agree with you, but then I, I I guess they figure it gets challenged in the courts, and are they prep are they prepared for that? Wow, <laughs> I know. I'm just trying to figure out why they're yeah. dragging their feet. Um, so. Before we go, I noticed that Professor Hussein posted on Facebook that the two of you were in, was it Detroit? Yeah, I was in the area. I, I, I go in and help take care of my father and uh, and Adnan happened to be in town giving a talk at Wayne State University. Fantastic. And I didn't realize, I mean, I went to these places when I was a little kid, but I just had no idea just how close the Art Institute was to the university. It was like literally two blocks away. And what was your talk on, Professor? Oh, it was on uh, the Holy Fire miracle um, uh, then and now. So I've updated with some more contemporary uh, uh, evidence about uh, 2022 and 2021, how it was performed during COVID and post-COVID. Um, and so, yeah, so I talked a little bit about that. I had a what is the audience. what is the Holy Fire miracle? Oh, the Holy Fire is uh, an annual miracle, uh, sort of a liturgical miracle that's part of the uh, Easter week uh, celebrations that uh, occurs on Holy Saturday, the day before Easter, and symbolizes Christ's resurrection. 
Um, and, um, you know, in um, Christian churches during this period, they turn off the lights of the church, extinguish all of the lights. Um, and on uh, Sunday, you're supposed to relight or like Saturday night, you're supposed to relight uh, these candles and lanterns and lamps of a church with a new fire. In Jerusalem, in the Church of the Resurrection at the Holy Sepulchre, a miracle happens. Okay, I'll use it that in scare quotes for those who want me to be skeptical, but I don't think that's the important part of it. Uh, a fire emerges from the tomb that is then used to light uh, with the new fire. And it's attended by thousands, typically, um, for Easter services uh, on on the Holy Saturday. So I gave a talk about that, and it's medieval history, and it's more contemporary um, uses. And um, use that as an opportunity to explore a really great city, Detroit. I mean, I really had not known very much about it. I've been to Dearborn, which is sort of the center of Arab America, and they have a Arab American museum and uh, so on. Uh, but I hadn't really ventured into Detroit. It's a beautiful city, the Detroit River, Windsor, uh, Ontario's on the other side of the Ambassador Bridge, um, and amazing architecture. Of course, there's so much blight, but it's a city with real character. And um, the Detroit Institute of Arts is just a wonderful museum. I guess that's what happens when wealthy industrialists go and buy artifacts from around the world and bring them back home to show the the little people you know why it's good to have you know such wealthy patrons right they really do have a great and the diego rivera court that's i think the thing i enjoyed the most just such an, an unbelievable uh testimonial as well as critique of Detroit's kind of industrial modernity. It's it's incredible. So I just encourage everyone to go and it was great to enjoy it with some old friends and and new and to meet uh, Marianne for the first time in person. Fantastic. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Really fantastic. Hey, look at what Joe did. I, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm watching you cook tonight and listening to the professors, it was a gift to me. I don't know about anybody else, but this was a gift. Uh, so it's from the, from the sacred to the profane. Satan, Satan, Bourguignon. It's mushrooms and uh, black bean. It's a fermented black bean paste. So it uh, has a bit of beefiness to it, I guess. Yeah. And I sauteed some snow peas and carrots with garlic and uh, cilantro. And then I made a quick pickle of the chahote squash, which is very, uh, very crunchy, kind of like jicama with uh, dill and white pepper and, uh, and uh, Dijon uh, mashed potatoes also wow. underneath that. Not quite as pretty as the start. Sorry. That's pretty good. That's <laughs> pretty good. We'll see everybody at office hours. Follow Professor Marianne on Twitter at Razor Girl. Professor Adnan Hussein hosts Guerrilla History and the Mudgeless podcast. Who do you have coming up? Uh, well, we we started a series on sources and methods, and we had two editions. One, I've mentioned the collected uh, works of the Black Liberation Army, and then we had a discussion about a new collection on communist uh, Black women uh, and some amazing documents and writings by them. And um, I believe we have a new episode coming out uh, Friday um, that is about uh, sanctions. No, sorry, it's not about we're recording about sanctions on Syria, but we're dealing with the 50th anniversary of the Wounded Knee occupation, uh, 1973. Um, American Indian movement occupied uh, Wounded Knee on the Pine Ridge Reservation. And we talk with um, uh, a descendant uh, who uh, and an activist um, of uh, uh, from those times about indigenous history and what this uh, occupation meant and why we should commemorate it. Fantastic. And Professor John will be teaching The Twilight Zone, Columbo and Star Trek. At office hours. Yes, Twilight Zone at uh, 9.30 uh, Eastern Time, Friday. Star Trek at 2 p.m. on Saturday. And um, Columbo Watch Party on um, uh, Sunday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Fantastic. 
Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Feeling nothing but love. Nothing. Just feeling love. Just feeling a lot of love. Nothing but love. Donald Trump's campaign manager and senior counselor inside the White House, professional liar Kellyanne Conway, announced today that she and her husband, George Conway, are ending their marriage. Kellyanne said she could no longer put up with her husband's facts. She accused him of being a compulsive truth teller. Marriage, she said, is built on dishonesty. And when a husband tells one verifiable truth, It snowballs into a series of verifiable truths. And then you begin to wonder if everything coming out of his mouth is one big accuracy. Kellyanne says she thought she loved George, but is now wondering if their entire relationship was built on not a lie. Kellyanne says the divorce was a difficult decision because she hates the idea of families getting separated Unless, of course, they're dark-skinned Guatemalan refugees at the border. Kellyanne's husband, George Conway, is a Washington attorney who, if you remember, cried tears of joy on election night 2016 after Donald Trump was elected president. He cried tears of joy because George knew that meant he would be seeing less and less of his horror show of a wife. I've always seen Marianne and George as a modern day Jim Carville and Mary Madeline. If instead of Mary Madeline, Jim Carville married a rabid hyena. Kellyanne and her husband desperately try to keep the marriage together for the sake of how it would look. And also for their children, but mostly for the sake of how it would work or look. Look. George Conway, a right-wing corporate attorney, was a huge Trump supporter, but turned on him when it became apparent Trump wasn't going to appoint him Solicitor General of the United States. It was after George never found work in the White House that he decided Trump was bad for the country. Conway gained notoriety by being the first to publicly diagnose Trump with a narcissistic personality disorder. Conway recognized all the traits of a narcissistic personality disorder after noticing Trump sounded exactly like the woman lying next to him in bed. Emphasis on the word lying, lying next to him in bed. Up until recently, up until recently, Kellyanne and her husband were considered the exemplar of a conservative power couple with strong Christian values balancing both work and family in Washington, D.C. With their divorce, that couple is now Matt and Mercedes Schlapp. That would be uh, Mercedes and Matt Schlapp this week at CPAC. CPAC. On the right is Mercedes standing by her by. And here is Donald Trump speaking tonight at CPAC. And he is just taunting Matt Schlapp. Watch how he just goes out of his way to tease Matt Schlapp. Listen to this. The racist Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg, who is presiding over one of the most dangerous and violent cities in the United States. Did you did you hear what he just said? Listen to this. What what did you say? Straits. Okay, so we all know about Matt Schlapp's problem. And, and, and Donald Trump is taunting him by saying the racist Manhattan district. Right. right. How to do that. Matt Schlapp, the man who invited Donald Trump to speak at CPAC is being sued by a male campaign staffer for Herschel Walker. The staffer, male staffer, is uh, claiming credibly that Matt Schlapp pounded on his junk. And Donald Trump has to tease Matt Schlapp by saying, Straight. Wow, you are so cruel, Donald Trump. So you're basically saying Republicans only want votes from the... The racist Manhattan nah, District. Yeah, that's not working. Straight. All right, and all right. That didn't work. Uh, 
Anyway, Donald Trump is very cruel. And then Donald Trump, the candidate, made a pitch for why only he can bring back the golden days of America when he was president. And I will save your jobs. We had the greatest job history of any president ever. Wow. Is that true? Donald Trump had the greatest job history of any president ever? I'm going to vote for let, Let's check that out. This is uh, from ABC News, their website. Let's go full screen here. This is from ABC News. It says here that on his way out, Donald Trump became the first president since Herbert Hoover during the Great Depression to leave office with fewer jobs than when he entered office. About 2.5 million fewer jobs uh, when he left office. I guess he misspoke, and, uh, and I'm sure he's uh, going to correct himself because he would never lie to people at CPAC. Well, then Mr. Trump promised to get tough on immigration. Here he is. Under my leadership, we will use all necessary state, local, federal, and military resources to carry out the largest domestic deportation operation yeah. in American history. Like you did the last time. Other countries are emptying out their prisons, insane asylums, and mental institutions, and sending all of their problems right into their dumping ground, the USA. Think of it. They're emptying out their prisons, and you've heard me say that, but they're also emptying out their mental institutions. And uh, to use a strong couple of words, insane asylum, insane asylum. Wow. Insane asylum. They're turning this country into an insane asylum. It's going to start looking like CPAC. I don't know, Mr. Trump, if the rest of the world is sending us their crazies for the sake of your party, I'd get these people registered to vote as soon as possible. And then Donald Trump continued with his type of misogyny that has characterized the man's political career since the beginning. Here he is, and I just do not approve of this, and I'm playing this as an example of how low they're willing to go. And you know what Michelle Obama says, when they go low, we go high. And here he is, once again, attacking the way a woman looks, which you should never, ever, ever do. To bring charges against me for now ancient, no affair story of Stormy Horseface Daniels, no attraction. <laughs> and did you hear the way they laughed at when, when he called her? Stormy Horseface Daniels. Well, you know what? Our side does not do that. When they go low, we go high. I would never, ever sink to that level. Our side doesn't do that. Anyway, back to Kellyanne Conway and her husband uh, splitting up. It's going to be nasty. Uh, Kellyanne hates George more than anyone in the world, with the possible exception of herself. I'm told this divorce could end up being the ugliest divorce in Washington history unless lawyers on both sides can convince the couple to show up to court with bags over their heads. Stormy Horseface Daniels. Now, people say the marriage was torn apart because George couldn't stand the fact that his wife worked for Trump. Trust me on this. George Conway is no saint. He was Paula Jones's attorney. He was part of the ultra right wing legal establishment that impeached Bill Clinton. And before Kellyanne, this guy dated Laura Ingram, Laura Ingram from Fox News. He went from Laura Ingram to Kellyanne Conway. He's got about as much taste in significant others as Kurt Cobain. He came way too late. I'm sorry. He came way too late to the I hate Donald Trump party. Way too late. Even worse, he co-founded the Lincoln Project, which essentially spends money mocking Trump while worming its way into the Democratic Party to make us, my party, more right wing. Stay out of our party. OK, 
George Conway isn't on your side. He's on the supply side. The only thing I have in common with George Conway is we both have an equal distaste for Trump and Kellyanne. It took two years into Trump's presidency for the Lincoln Project to get founded. Yeah, Conway earns anywhere between three and six million a year as a corporate attorney in Washington, D.C. He waited until Trump gave the rich their massive tax cuts in 2017. And then all of a sudden it's time to say, I am utterly disgusted by this man's behavior. Well, it's not like their marriage didn't have any highlights. Here's a picture of the power couple at Donald's inauguration. George is seen here obediently holding Kellyanne's stole made entirely from Sarah Huckabee's pubic hair. And uh, here is the couple back in 2017. And this was right after Trump uh, was inaugurated. Uh, Out of an abundance of caution, George isn't wearing a tie or shoelaces for fear that he'll remember who he's married to and try to hang himself. Kellyanne has a large smile on her face in this picture because it was taken immediately after she just spotted a homeless woman breastfeeding a kitten. As you can see, Kellyanne is wearing a vest and a skirt consisting of handcrafted leather made using a tanning process that gives it the same texture and feel as her face. Stormy horse face, Daniels. Well, Kellyanne Conway is still very much involved in Donald Trump's attempt to reclaim the White House. At Republican fundraisers, Donald and Kellyanne can still wow the crowd. They can still wow the crowd whenever Donald points to parts of her body right before he grabs them without permission. By the way, uh, Donald says Kellyanne is like a daughter to him because he wouldn't mind sleeping with her either. Donald Trump, interesting thing about Donald Trump is he can tell whether a woman had just been fantasizing about Rush Limbaugh's ghost or Roger Ailes's ghost simply by the smell of her fingers. And this is from 2019. This is one of my favorite pictures of Kellyanne. Whenever there were more than three black people visiting the Oval Office, Kellyanne would immediately take to Instagram and post a selfie of herself tinkling on the couch. That would be uh, Kellyanne tinkling on the couch. Donald Trump before... Delivering a big speech will often draw inspiration by taking a deep hit off of one of Kellyanne's infamous triple quad baconator belches from Wendy's. And uh, Kellyanne considers her crowning achievement in the White House to be interrupting the COVID press conferences 15 times to steal another Hermes scarf right off Dr. Deborah Burks's neck in mid-sentence. And Kellyanne Conway and President Trump both share a passion for stealing the laptop belonging to Mike Pence's wife, Karen Pence, and checking out her secret stash of lipstick sister of Sappho porn. That's them just checking out Karen Pence's Secret stash of lipstick, sister of Sappho porn. A little too much information about Karen Pence than I choose to know. This is, uh, oh, this is, well, we, whoa, 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 whoa. This is not what I wanted to show you. This is what I wanted to show you. This is a great picture. Uh, this is Kellyanne Conway using her right hand to politely stifle a yawn. A lot of people don't realize that's where Kellyanne's mouth is. It's, it's down there, and she's politely stifling a yawn. Most people have a mouth up there, but her mouth uh, is down there. Interesting, isn't it? I find it, find it to be interesting. 
Whenever she misses her old job working inside the Oval Office, Kellyanne Conway often stands outside the White House in a green dress, insisting to anyone who will listen that her dress is dark blue. That's green, right? I'm colorblind. Anyway, she likes to stand in front of the White House when she misses her old job and uh, insists that the dress she's wearing is dark blue. Obviously, there has always been massive sexual tension between Attorney General Bill Barr and Kellyanne Conway, because as they say, opposite eating disorders attract. That is absolutely true, what they say. Opposite eating disorders attract. Stormy horseface Daniels. Okay, and how many of you think it smells like Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross just did number one in his pants? So I think we all agree it smells like he did number two. Moving on. Well, in all seriousness, George and Kellyanne Conway were married for more than two decades. And it saddens me to think that any of those years might have been happy ones. There is uh, evil in this world, people who crave power and don't use it to help the least among us are pure evil. Forget her lies, forget her leaks. Kellyanne Conway and her husband use none of their power, money or influence to bring about Medicare for all, free tuition at all public universities or an end to homelessness. They both came to Washington accepting the world as it is, and instead of changing it, they cashed in. They were born irredeemable, and they will spend the rest of their pitiful lives that way. I'm David Feldman, reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. Stormy Horseface Daniels. I couldn't have said it any better. Just remember, when they go low, we go even lower. Go even lower than they go.